Well, good morning, and welcome to James with Jesus on this Thursday, March 25th, uh, broadcasting live from the backyard. And so, um, following the devotion, if you want to hang out for a backyard garden tour, you're welcome to. Um, so today, um, yesterday I had my Master Gardener's course, and it was talking about tree identification and tree health and other things. So it it got me thinking about how exciting it was for me to uh, just, again, be able to identify some plants, some trees, and it, it almost feels like you've, you've uh, I don't know, the gaining the knowledge makes it a little more powerful. I, I don't know exactly the right verbiage to use, but it was, it's exciting to me just to, to, to learn things such as that. So this is in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God took the man, and another uh, uh, translation I have calls this earth creature, Adam. So the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So one of the earliest chores for Adam, earth creature, was in naming things. Uh, again, I, when I think about naming or identifying, another thing I've experienced and I've witnessed is that, um, for instance, if something, if somebody's going through something, I remember the first time when I was in seminary and a lot of the feelings that I was having as far as con confusion and this and that and other things, uh, an author, captured it perfectly and just the fact that the author was able to identify it and realize oh this is kind of a common thing that everybody goes through or most people go through there was a sense of relief given to that and I think about people who are um, living in uncertainty with medical diagnoses uh, the uncertainty sometimes is more disturbing than when they actually get uh, a diagnosis that that can be very serious but just knowing what they're facing, naming it, uh, gives a certain amount of um, of relief to that to that process. Uh, we, as many of you know, our, our daughter, son-in-law, and two granddaughters uh, moved in with us in January, and our two-year-old granddaughter is going through that stage of naming objects. And of course, so so we're having fun with that too. And. Renee gets her up sometimes in the morning and says, oh, well, let's put on your socks, pick out a, pick out a shirt, let's put on pants. Um, and to see um, Olivia be able to name things now, you can tell that she, she is uh, becoming more, uh, more in control, more well-versed in her environment to be able to, to know that once you've named something, then when somebody else says this word to you, oh, oh go get your shoes on, she can run off and get her shoes. Um, it just not only fosters our communication, but again, this sense of uh, the, this strange environment that you're in, you're now able to name many things. Um, I think back to, I'll go back to planting and, and, and naming things. Probably one of the first plants in, when we moved to Charlotte, and I guess it was 80, 89, that I learned the name of was red tips because everybody was using them as these wonderful hedge plants and they were they were gorgeous they grew pro prolifically um, they they were attractive when the red red tips began to emerge with the new leaves but because they were overplanted and and now looking back on it my hedge that was in place before I got there was planted way too close to one another I mean these these plants that could grow 10 feet tall and four or five feet wide were planting on about 18 inch centers so they're just jammed in to form this hedge well of course fungus loved that then and was able to go from plant to plant to plant to plant and so red tips photinia 
um, were decimated by this um, fungal leaf spot. And so if you lived in the south or had red tips, um, you'll notice that they've, they've gone not quite the way of the dodo bird. They're still good for individual plants, but very few people are recommending them to be used for, for hedges. So um, that's all I've got for about the power of naming and um, being able to, uh, again, become more familiar with one's own environment. Uh, I know that for the many of the students at Clemson, I, I think Daniel Kuhn was, was one of these students, that uh, one of their projects was to go through the Clemson Experimental Forest and be able to name species. I think uh, Mariah had that class and I'm sure plenty of others too. But again, as, as people grow in their proficiency in their respective fields that they're going to then go out and serve in, uh, identification is key, certainly in the medical community and whether that's in the plant community too. They said before you can treat something, you, you need to properly identify the plant. You pro need to properly name it because it'll take you in the right direction. So as droplets of rain are beginning to fall, <laughs> let me offer a prayer and then we'll do a, a, a little bit of a tour in this overcast light. So let us pray. Holy God, thank you for this new day. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Uh, the birds in the air above us, the plants around us, uh, the many surprises that you give to us as, as new growth is coming forth in the world. Uh, help us to always positively name others and name things, uh, to respect each other and to call us by the names we prefer, to uh, help us to be able to go about your world in a way that we can enjoy your creation, that we can revel in the diversity that you've given to us across the board and that we can help shape a community that honors you, that honors one another, that loves each other, that tries to make the world a better place for everyone. These things we ask and pray in Jesus name. Amen. So for any that want to disconnect at this point, please feel free to and this will be um, around the garden in, in, in three or four minutes. Backyard, uh, if the front yard is focused more on daffodils, the backyard I have a lot more iris and daylily. Uh, I do have some, vol not, not volunteers, but these, these daffodils were here before I arrived. I've surrounded them with, um, with iris, but I don't know the name of this one. So it has very distinctive petal pattern, uh, has ruffles on the actual cup. I just haven't taken the time to go back and and be able to identify that. Over here, again, the compost, uh, the bad stuff there. I don't say bad, the raw materials there. But this is now, this is now the the compost, and it's just wonderfully crumbly. Uh, that I add to the garden, you can see almost no stick to the hand. My neighbor Max was able to identify when this tree fell last year. It was a black tupelo, just a gorgeous tree in the fall. Um, in fact, yesterday the, the arborist was saying that she recommends black tupelo over red maples. They do better in our area. So if you're looking for a tree to, to mimic a, a beautiful, colorful red maple, you might consider black tupelo. I was surprised this morning. I haven't been out back in probably uh, maybe four or five days and I found my first white iris had, had bloomed. I didn't even know it had budded yet and it was already blooming. These are the rose bushes that um, have pruned back for the start of the year. This plant was a volunteer that came over with Donna Coakley's iris and I don't know what it is. I, last year I left it because I could see that from the, from the leaf that it appeared to be more of a plant that was, um, you know, obviously a plant, but I guess what I'm saying more of a floral plant versus a weed. And so I just let it be. And this year it's blooming. So again, I have not identified that one yet. So that's, that's a to-do list for me. With, with um, very adventuresome granddaughters, I've had to erect a little bit more uh, things just to help support a plant, but also maybe to keep some feet away from it. This is my peony that last year bloomed for the first time. This was a plant, I, I would 
I think it's almost baby's breath, but I'm not sure for sure. That one came from uh, Judy Keys, uh, gave me a, a, a cutting of that last year. These are some of the Easter lilies that don't get claimed in the church. I decide, well, I'll start, I'll put them in the ground, see what they do, and have just erected the hoops again to keep feet away from them. Some of the transplanted uh, Lenten roses are just going gangbusters in these these locations. So obviously this is one of the most preferred sites for those, but I have them throughout the backyard. Um, and this is from David Foster, Forsythia, that's really coming along now. And then you'll see through the a stone stack, stacked stone wall that our daughters, granddaughters love climbing on. The um, squirrels have really been excavating back here in the compost, or in the mulch, I should say. Um, John and Jackie Broadwell gave me a couple camellias. This one's doing all right. It might need a little bit more fertilizer there, uh, but it did survive the transplant, which was good. And I always forget where I plant where I transplanted the second one but it's also doing well and then lastly last stop just because again the by the gate white camellia it continues to bloom beautifully and so uh, I can see this from my office and just really enjoy it so so I hope you have a blessed day. Looks like we might get a little bit of spritzing. I'm not sure how, how much it will go. And, and uh, I'll see you on Saturday. Bye-bye.